Once upon a time, the Catholic Church had rival sitting popes. For a long time, in fact. The Great Western Schism lasted from 1378 to 1417. 39 years! An entire generation of believers lived under opposing ecclesiastical leadership. And to this very day, 600 years later, there is no official pronouncement as to which was the true pope. What was the effect that this generational schism had on the church? Well, on today's show, called The Extra Pope, Something's Happening Here looks to the past to learn not just the immediate effects of what happens when a society has two rival leaders at the same time, but the long-term effects as well. We hope to see a pattern that, when applied to our day today, easily bridges the gap between our day and Revelation 13. All right, friends, welcome back. Today's Wednesday, if you're watching this in real time, and so it's hump day, so to speak. Thank you for having your midweek spiritual energizing moment with us. Now let's get right to it because we're going back in time today, but I also want to talk theology a little bit. Uh, we are discussing the problem of two rival leaders in power at the same time. So did you know that this happened in the church once upon a time? I And, and you must, when I say the church, you know that we have to be talking 1500 or earlier, because as soon as the Protestant Reformation happened, there wasn't just one church anymore. But yes, at the time that this happened, there was in fact just one church. The Orthodox would say there were at least two, because it was after the Orthodox had you know, done their own thing. So there's the Orthodox and the Catholic. But for most living people at the time, there was the one church. And then suddenly there were two. Let's read about it. We're going to um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is called JustBritannica.com. And they're going to teach us about the Western Schism which is also called the Great Schism or the Great Western Schism. <laughs> um, this is a period that lasted from 1378 to 1417 when there were two and later three rival popes, each with his own following, his own sacred college of cardinals, and his own administrative offices. So right away we realize there's not a direct parallel to the current situation with Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden and not just because neither of those men are Pope. <laughs> but Mr. Trump does not have his own cabinet, his own military, his own all of the things that the actual president has. So you go back in time to 1378, and these rival popes did. They had like functioning churches, functioning church governments that were just opposed to each other. All right, how did this happen? Shortly after the return of the papal residents to Rome, following almost 70 years of the Avignon papacy, the Archbishop, Archbishop of Bari was elected Pope as Urban VI, as, uh, amid demands by the Roman populace for, quote, a Roman or at least an Italian. So again, what, what had gone on was that this 70-year this period, um, the the Pope didn't reside in Rome during that period. He, he resided in, in Avignon. And so after that time went on, the Italian people wanted their Pope back. And they said, all right, no, you got to come back home. And the Pope has to be an, a Roman or at least an Italian. <laughs> so Urban was elected. But according to this article, he proved to be so hostile to the Cardinals who had assumed great powers during the years at Avignon, that a group of those cardinals retired to Anagni and elected one of themselves as Pope Clement VII, claiming the election of Urban VI had been invalid. Does that sound a little bit more like the modern day? <laughs> I mean, that is kind of what, exactly what Mr. Trump did. Um, he was pretty hostile when he was actually in power. He was hostile openly to um, to the deep state, so to speak, right? The kind of entrenched administrative state. 
and he hated and he was hostile toward the media and he was hostile towards everybody who said anything negative against him, whether you were in the government or a reporter or not. I mean, Mr. Trump is, is a narcissist. Love him or hate him. He is entirely, entirely absorbed with his own self. So he was run out of office, either rightly or wrongly. You you determine. I don't really care what you believe about that. But he lost the election and he was not in office anymore. But <laughs> he continued to claim that the election that drove him out of power was invalid. He is to this day claiming that. And so he has set himself up not as president, of course, right? But as this like political figure who still rides around with giant motorcades. He still gets Secret Service protection. He still... um is called President Donald Trump by a lot of people. You don't believe me? Look up anything about him on like a media outlet that's friendly to him. And you will see, you'll see this. They don't qualify President Trump with former often. They'll just say President Trump. <laughs> or you get this a lot on social media where they don't have to abide by any sort of journalistic standards at all. So people broadly on Tumblr, on Truth Social, on Facebook sometimes, although not so much. Um, but but pretty much anywhere you look on Instagram, you'll find people, President Trump, President Trump. So what happened to the Catholic Church because of this problem? This article continues and says the double election had disastrous effects upon the church. The followers of the two popes were divided chiefly along national lines and thus the dual papacy fostered the political antagonisms of the time. The spectacle of rival popes denouncing each other produced great confusion and resulted in a tremendous loss of prestige for the papacy. Does that sound like a prophecy? It does to me. So both of the rival American presidents are American. So we're not being divided along national lines. But we are being divided along ideological lines. And when you realize how deeply entrenched those ideologies are in the hearts of the people that hold to them, we, we could, it's a bit of a stretch, but we could kind of honestly say that we are being divided along national lines. Right? There's conservative America and there's liberal America. <laughs> and so it's not just two men who are opposed to each other, but we're fostering the political antagonisms of the time, of the modern day, just like the rival popes did back then. And just like back then, when the spectacle of rival popes denouncing each other produced great confusion and resulted in loss of prestige, for the papacy, I think, I think the spectacle of rival presidents denouncing each other has produced great confusion and will result in a tremendous loss of prestige for the presidency. I mean, I, I don't think it can happen any other way. Already, already, I for one, and I know that I'm not the only one, I have lost pretty much all of my respect for Every government agency, FBI, IRS, CIA, DOJ, whatever, right? NIH, <laughs> all, all the alphabet soup of the government. I don't care. Pretty, pretty much I've reached a point now where whatever they say, I kind of instinctively just believe the opposite. Because how could it be otherwise? The lies that come from the government are so bold and they're so objective. Um. And it's like, sometimes you just want to say, like, tell me the truth. I don't even care if I don't like it. Just stop lying to me. And because they won't, you know, because you know there's more to it than what you're hearing, your mind goes to something else, to a conspiracy theory or to a rebellious attitude or to the idea that the guy who lost the election is the actual real president. Your mind goes places it shouldn't go. Well, the scripture for today 
this is again, this is going to be kind of a homiletical use of this scripture, but I'm going to Daniel chapter two, verse 40. We talked about uh, the prophecy of Daniel two on last week's episode. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. But in verse 40, we are told that the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron in as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. We identified that fourth kingdom as Rome um, when we studied out the prophecy last week. And I'm going to tell you that 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 idea of Rome continues even past the downfall of the secular pagan government and the uh, and the kind of establishment of the religious government of Rome, the Catholic Church. I say that for prophetic reasons because the the metal that makes that makes the legs. I'm realizing if you didn't watch last week's show, I'm using words that don't mean anything to you. But um, this is a statue in the shape of a man, and each metal on the statue represents a different kingdom. The legs that are made out of iron represent Rome. And then it has feet that are still made out of iron, but it has clay mixed in. And that clay represents God's people. So really, it's those feet where we see the establishment of the um, the religious empire, the Catholic Church throughout the middle ages but this is why i say it's homiletic rather than a, a legit study because i want to point out the statue has two legs of iron not just one but two like whatever rome is going to do is going to happen in duel and like the most obvious example of this is how it literally split in two and it became the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. But I think pretty much any rabbit hole that you go down, you can find a duality to whatever Rome is doing. And and I'm just continuing that into the Roman power when it was held in the church instead of in the state. So isn't it interesting that in church history, we have these rival government systems, only for a time, but rival government systems. And in the prophecy that points to Rome itself, we have two legs. <laughs> and they never come together again, do they? They come separated out of the single torso right? Break into two legs, but they never come together again. The feet are separate and then there's no more person. So it doesn't surprise me when we find this moment in time when the church splits into two. Yes, it does come together again, but never the way that it was. Because even though this Western schism ended in 1417, what happened just a hundred years later? The Protestant Reformation happened a hundred years later. And why was the church in a weakened enough state to allow Martin Luther to do what he did? Like, why wasn't he burned at the stake like so many martyrs before him? It's because the church wasn't powerful enough to do that. Now, in the larger picture, they were also at war with the Muslims in Eastern Europe. So there was a political reason they weren't strong also. But this, this schism, this loss of power, loss of prestige was a mark on the church from which it has never recovered. Like literally never to this day has never recovered. And I am suggesting that the mark that will happen against America and against the American presidency will be the same. Even if we get through this crisis, even if, you know, the Trump and Biden thing goes away and wouldn't it be funny if neither one of them actually get the nomination for the next, <laughs> for the next election. Um, but even no matter what the outcome is, history shows us you never come back together. You never are made quite whole the way you were before the schism occurred in the first place. So at this point, we need to advocate for God. We need to advocate for peacemaking. We need to advocate for all the things I've been saying all week. But I'm not even sure it will really matter. It may mitigate whatever is coming, but will it fix whatever is coming? I actually don't think so. I think we. I think 
this system has become irrevocably broken, irreversibly broken. And it hurts my heart to say that, but I do believe it. So in the, what, it looks like we're out of time. So let's pray right now because we really need God's wisdom. Let's pray right now. Father, we need to know what to do. Even if we receive your grace enough to elevate our emotions above the immediate crisis of Trump and Biden, what do we do after that? What do we do in a society that has been fractured and can't come together again? What do we do with institutions that have been damaged uh, and can't be fixed? How do we operate in that society? How do we represent you in that society? How do we uphold what is good? And I wish I had answers, but I don't. So we are relying on you, Father, to give us wisdom, to show us what to do, and to be our leader as you promised. You say, you go before us, you are with us, and you will never leave us nor forsake us. So go before us, Father, and make your leadership known to us so we can follow you and be confident that we're following your lead. Lord, this is a heavy moment in time. Calm our hearts. Remind us that Jesus is coming soon and that your kingdom, which will follow, will never, ever, ever come to an end and will never have a rival God ever again because Satan himself will be put to death. Bless us, Father. Forgive our sins and give us grace enough to come back again tomorrow. Amen. So now come back again tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> on Facebook, that means you're going to the Steve Hicks page and liking it to become a follower of it. On YouTube, that means you go to the Talking Donkey International channel and subscribe to it and hit your notification bell. On Rumble, you find the Something's Happening Here channel, hit your follow button. On Locals, you find the Something's Happening Here community and join it. And please also become a supporter for a small fee. You get extra material that's not published elsewhere. Or if you just can't do social media at all, then you go to talkingdonkeyinternational.org slash podcast and get the entire uh, archive there. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Stay calm out there. <laughs> I'll see you Thursday. <laughs>